uh, thank you for showing up here only two days before Thanksgiving. Particularly in as much as you could pick this up on YouTube just as well as being here. It's very important to have the backs of some heads so that people who look at the video don't think I'm lecturing to a completely empty room. The uh, book that is uh, the basis of this course is divided into eight parts. You probably have not made note of any of the part names because they're pretty feeble. Uh, but we have four parts for the first half of the course and four parts for the second half of the course. And part four, which we began uh, last week and will occupy this week and the next two weeks, is entitled Interregional Patterns of Culture and Contact. It's almost impossible to forget a phrase like that, interregional patterns of culture and contact. Uh, this is a sort of soft determinism, that is to say, it is it reflects the broad theme of the world coming together so that the preceding part was on the um, was on the elaboration of cultural communities and it dealt with specific areas. And this part is supposed to deal with how areas come into contact. Uh, this part does not successfully do that. Uh, particularly as we will see next week when we have a chapter entitled uh, The Latin West, which is the single narrowest chapter in the entire book in that it only deals with, uh, with Western Europe, a matter over which the authors engaged in some debate. But this chapter for this week is on the uh, tropical Africa and Asia. Uh, I have raised as a query for this week whether the word tropical is um, like Oriental, a word uh, invented by uh, Western uh, scholars and writers as, and not for the purpose of, but with the uh, with the effective result of, uh, in, of putting people who live in tropical climes in a negative position as people who are you know, exotic and lazy and don't have big civilizations and are um, brown and have other characteristics. Now, I would uh, think that uh, one could get a fairly substantial mileage out of doing to uh, the word tropical what Edward Said did to the word the Orient, unless one feels that that's already been done enough. But the question is, what is it that, you know, other than that word, that would um, provide some sort of a theme for the uh, for viewing tropical Africa and tropical Asia uh, in the same chapter up to uh, 1500. If you look at the index of the book, and, you, and this is some, just something that people who are addicted to counting things do, uh, when you go to an index and you're trying to find out what a book is about, it's often worthwhile to see what are the things most frequently referred to. Because then it saves you the trouble of reading the book. Uh, you can see whether the book is going to be about things that interest you or whether it's simply going to be, you know, another history of, you know, Eleanor of Aquitaine or something. So, uh, query. Who is the most frequently cited, not, not, I shouldn't say cited, the most frequently mentioned person in all of world history according to the earth and its peoples, judging from the index? Mm 
the answer is Napoleon. But Napoleon is only one mention ahead of Ibn Battuta. Uh, Alexander the Great, Muhammad, Genghis Khan, uh, you know, they're pretty important, but hey, compared with Ibn Battuta, uh, how in the world can you put them in, even in the same sentence? Because Ibn Battuta is close to being the most important person in world history. So I went and I checked one of our rival uh, uh, textbooks uh, by uh, Bentley and Ziegler. And I said, well, how does Napoleon fare there? He's only mentioned once. Ibn Battuta is mentioned seven times, has seven index citations. He is outdone by Alexander the Great, uh, Hitler, and Nikita Khrushchev. Um, but he is really up there with, uh, with you know, world historical bad guys, or men of power, whatever you want to construe them as. And you realize that, you know, this person about whom you normally read absolutely nothing at all um, has a, uh, a role in the narration of world history that is uh, literally unparalleled uh, because he didn't conquer anything, he didn't rule anything. All he did was write a book. Uh, he didn't even have a clever name for the book. It's The Travels, the Urechla of Ibn Battuta. Uh, all of the citations of Ibn Battuta in uh, The Earth and Its Peoples are in the chapter that you have read for this week. Uh, because they are all within a specific time period, namely the time period when he made his, his travels. But he traveled in uh, South Asia, in the Indian Ocean, in uh, Africa, south of the Sahara, and he wrote things that are eminently quotable. So you can say, Ibn Battuta met so-and-so and saw such-and-such. -and, -such. Uh, and this, of course, um, is something that is not unique. There are other travelers, but what adds to the particular importance of, 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 importance of Ibn Battuta in this respect is that he's not a European. So he's not Marco Polo. He's not William of Rubric. He's not, uh, you know, John of Plano Carpini. He's not uh, any number of European travelers of whom we have many, many travel accounts. He is a North African Arab who, uh, who made these travels. And his book is very extensive. Uh, the edition that I have is a little over 660 pages uh, in a fairly small Arabic typescript. Um, it raises the question of what do you do with a travel account? There are essentially uh, two choices that you can, uh, that you have to choose between. One is to use it as a kind of um, uh, data source, you know, a grab bag in the sense that you can go there and find a quote. You know, you say, gee, I wonder if Ibn Battuta went to um, Shiraz. And if so, what he says about Shiraz. Uh, because I'm writing a little encyclopedia article in the history of Shiraz, and therefore I can get a little quote from Ibn Battuta. So I look him up and see, did he go to Shiraz? Yes, he did. And then I can quote him. Uh, or did he go to Mali? Or did he go to um, Delhi? And you can quote Ibn Battuta. That's one way of doing it, and that is the normal way to do it. The normal way to use this and virtually every other travel account. Now, the alternative <clears throat> the choice not taken is to look at the book as a whole and say, what was he doing? Why did he uh, make these uh, trips? How is the time uh, of his travels distributed over the course of the book? What is the itinerary uh, that he follows? Um, and when you do that, with Ibn Battuta, you get a rather different 
result. Um, first of all, even though he is uh, quoted by virtually everyone who writes about Sub-Saharan Africa, out of the 660 some pages, uh, about 18 of them deal with Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, he went there uh, and spent very little time, uh, but he made observations at a time when we have very few uh, alternative sources. On the other hand, he has about 200 pages dealing with his time in India. Well, that's 200 pages, that's a lot. And he has a lot to say about India and about the islands and the Indian Ocean. But most of the book deals with the Middle East. And 80 pages deal specifically with the pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, one of the uh, first uh, books that is structured around a narrative of pilgrimage uh, to, to Mecca. This is a genre that, from this time on, uh, takes off and becomes very, very important, so that uh, particularly in outlying areas such as Morocco or India, uh, accounts of visits to Mecca become a major genre. So we have scores of later manuscripts in various languages uh, talking about uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca, none of which are ever quoted. Uh, not, maybe not none, but very few of which. Because going to Mecca <coughs> is uh, not big news. Whereas going to the Maldive Islands uh, or going to Mali, uh, that is, that's more unusual. On the other hand, you could say that the importance of a journey uh, is perhaps better thought of as being proportional to the number of people who go to that site than it is to the, um, to the number that happen to go to very outlying areas. So when you, when you go through Ibn Battuta and you see his itinerary, which spends good time in the Middle East, then goes to Mecca, then spends more time in the Middle East, and particularly goes up into areas uh, that are in the process of uh, a migration from uh, from Byzantine Christianity to Islam, that is to say in Anatolia uh, and up into Central Asia, there you get um, very interesting uh, materials, but they don't fit into a chapter that deals with tropical Asia and Africa. So here we simply see him uh, as someone who goes uh, to these southern, uh, these southern places. He is a very um, uh, I can't say he's a reliable observer because I wasn't there, so I don't know whether what he says is right or not. But there's a sobriety and a seriousness to the accounts that impresses most readers uh, as being uh, that of a, uh, of a careful observer. Uh, although he often observes things that are of less interest to us than uh, uh, than Oh, race relations or gender relations or things like that. For example, he's very punctilious about uh, rank, uh, particularly in court uh, affairs. You know, what are the, the uh, lines of, um, of rank and privilege in various societies? Um, he mentions uh, extensively his time in the Maldive Islands. Uh, which are in the Indian Ocean, a uh, group of islands that are uh, fairly numerous and barely above water. Uh, they are one of the most uh, homogeneously, ho homogeneous, <laughs> one of the most same <laughs> uh, areas of the world in terms of uh, religion. Uh, everyone is a Muslim. Uh, and uh, they, they are very uh, conscious of that. 
and they talk about who it was who brought Islam to the Maldives. And they say it's Abul Barakat al Berberi. Uh, this is this could be the word Berberi. In in Arabic script, that's a B here, that little thing. Or it's a T, or it's a TH, or it's a Y, depending on what dots you put on it. This letter here is either an R or a Z. Then we have another one, that's a B, a T, a TH, uh, or a Y. And then we have another one, that's an R or a Z. And then we have a good old familiar uh, long I or Y. So they say, OK, um, you put dots here, and you have, have better, better E. And so you say, OK, this is the guy who brought Islam to the Maldives. Better, better E. Well, the I on the end means it's a of or related to something. So of or related to better, better. So he must be a Berber. You know, oh, and Ibn, uh, Ibn Battuta, coming from North Africa, would have recognized this fellow Moroccan, uh, uh, at least by reputation, as the person who brings Islam to the Maldives. And you can't deny that Moroccans ever got to the Maldives, because Ibn Battuta got to the Maldives. So, uh, so you'll find a number of historical sites that uh, specifically say, uh, the Maldives were converted to Islam by a Berber from North Africa. Now, someone else does it and puts a, um, uh, an add something here and makes this a B, this a T, and an R, uh, this a Y, and this is Z, they say, I'm sorry, it's wrong. This is the T, this is the B. So they say, that's Tabriz. Um, all you do is change the dots around and add a little tooth. That's what's one tooth between friends. And you go from Berberi to Tabrizi. Tabriz is the largest city in northwestern Iran. Uh, it is in Iranian Azerbaijan. Uh, and so you will have other uh, historical sources that sources here in that's in quotes. I mean, we're not talking about modern conjectures about all this uh, that say that an Iranian from northwestern Iran made his way down to the Maldive Islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean and converted the people to Islam. So it's either a Berber from Morocco or it is an Iranian from Tabriz, or it's neither one. Uh, and you know, if you checked neither one in the box, you probably came out right, because there is a city, a seaport in Somalia that you can easily find on a map uh, named Berbera. And it is to my mind, virtually certain that a Somali seaport right there on the Indian Ocean is where Mr. Berberi came from. Uh, now, the point of this, uh, of this exercise in Arabic spelling is that when you have but one source and you have no um, Incidentally, the, the, the source in Ibn Battuta uh, sites was an inscription in which the dots were not, apparently not, a, not uh, written, and the inscription has uh, lasted through the 19th century and then disappeared, so nobody can see it anymore. But when you're dealing with a single source and you, uh, and you make an inference as important as what are the trade or travel patterns of people in this uh, late medieval period in the Indian Ocean, uh, you really have to be 
fairly careful. And uh, being careful uh, is something that I don't think the author of this chapter was. Uh, or um, I don't think he uh, devoted as much care to the precision of the writing as, uh, as he should have. Uh, first of all, you know, when you are dealing with tropical Africa and Asia, uh, there are certain things that do, uh, that do blend together, uh, that do um, uh, give you a, uh, a sense of some coming together, and they mostly have to do with seafaring <coughs> and the transit across the Indian Ocean, about which we have little information from the time period uh, that is specified, that is, say, before uh, 1550. Uh, there are many, many speculations. Uh, there are many things that are uh, known in the uh, in general that are not uh, where the specifics are not known. And I've mentioned before in earlier talking about the Indian Ocean, the phenomenon of the people of Madagascar speaking a language originating from Indonesia. Seemingly having reached Madagascar. Uh, before 500 AD. <coughs> but when it comes to the Indian Ocean uh, trading sphere, we have a lot of speculation and a paucity of information. Uh, let me take one topic in particular, and which is raised fairly extensively in this chapter, and that is the topic of slavery. Slavery is a, uh, a legitimate uh, topic in world history. It clearly is something of enormous importance to many parts of the world at different times. Uh, it's also clear that it is a word uh, that uh, covers a fairly substantial array of, uh, of status positions. If you go back, for example, to classical Indian texts uh, dealing with the the legal and political outlook of, um, of Hindu society in India, uh, you'll find that there are, that slaves are uh, acknowledged as existing and that there are certain categories uh, that, uh, that produce slaves. Uh, for example, being a captive in war can result in enslavement. Uh, being, you know, in, being a child of a slave can result in being, having the status of a slave. Being sold as a slave by your, uh, by your parents or some relative uh, can result in your uh, being a slave. Uh, being in debt can result in your becoming a slave. Uh, this being related to, uh, in, in, more, more often than not, to gambling debts, since gambling was a uh, notorious uh, vice of ancient India, uh, rather than the sort of debt peonage that you have in later colonial times. Uh, there are no, that's four leaving one out. But anyway, the point is that the slaves are, uh, are not a race, that the slaves are not a, um, a, a category that comes about in some uh, you know, uh, singular fashion. 
And by the time you get to the period covered by this chapter, you've added one more element to the slave uh, situation, and that is <coughs> um, military slaves, uh, people who are brought in to uh, the country to serve in the military and who have slave status. Uh, what you do not find, uh, in particular, is the use of slaves for agricultural labor on an extensive basis. If this could be wrong. That is to say, this could be a lack of data. Um, if you compare, say, ancient India with Rome, uh, Rome appears to have had more use of slaves for uh, laboring purposes. Uh, you know, on land. And yet it, it stands to reason, in, in effect, that slavery in South Asia would, would have certain limitations in, the, uh, in what we call the caste system, and which, you know, you have, what we call the caste system are two divisions you have a division into varnas, of which there are four. There are Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras, and then outcasts, people who are not there. And then you have Jatis. Jatis are subgroups within each varna, um, and they are the groups that the Portuguese uh, use the word casta for. So the caste system is, uh, is most accurately seen as describing the jatis of India, but when you read uh, Indian um, primary sources, uh, the focus is on the varnas, because the, uh, you know, the status of a person is as much related or, uh, to the Varna as to the Jati, particularly with respect to the two highest Varnas, the, uh, the Brahmins, who are the priestly class, and the Kshatriyas, uh, which is the warrior caste, or the warrior Varna. Uh, among the Jatis, the divisions are, uh, more often than not, have to do with occupation. So you'll have um, uh, people who engage in a particular trade will belong to a certain jati, people who, uh, believe, who belong to a, who practice a certain craft will belong to a jati. Um, and all the way down to people who, who sweep out latrines they will belong to a certain jati. Uh, there's a strict uh, hierarchy of um, uh, socialization and avoidance that exists among these jatis. And in this situation, you have to ask yourself, wh how would a slave fit in? Um, who would own a slave? Most of the information we have about owning slaves has to do with rulers. And we can cite accounts of uh, perhaps some reliability talking about the huge numbers of slaves a ruler might have, most often prisoners of war. But in terms of slaves becoming part of an economy, um, how, would this, how would this happen? Now, you can talk to specialists on India and say, you know, tell me about you know, slavery in pre-modern India. And you're more likely to get the answer, uh, I don't know anything about that, than, uh, than a substantive answer. Because you don't have any discussions in Indian sources uh, beyond these references to the slaves owned by, uh, by rulers. And that relates to the whole question of um, how many slaves were there? It's a big debate. 
there has for a long time been uh, a debate over the number of slaves that went from Africa across the Atlantic Ocean to the Caribbean and to North and South America. <clears throat> and you get a fair consensus now that maybe seven and a half million slaves, something like that. Then you have the debate over how many slaves crossed the Indian Ocean. And were they all Africans? Or were even most of them Africans? Uh, what you will find in, uh, in the chapter that's been assigned for this week is a statement that says that between 1200 and 1500, uh, historians agree that two and a half million African slaves uh, crossed the Indian Ocean. That works out to 20,000 slaves per year. If you start looking into, uh, into more detailed accounts of slavery, you'll find that when the British got into the business of trying to terminate slavery in the 19th century, they estimated that there were about 20,000 slaves uh, per year that were trafficked uh, in the Indian Ocean area. And that number precedes that date to some degree, but does it go back to 1200? Uh, more recent work uh, that's been done on the records of the Dutch East India Company, which doesn't come into being until after 1600, um, has come up with, uh, with hard counts for the numbers of slaves that the Dutch East India Company themselves trafficked in. And they are dealing with a matter of, um, uh, oh, as many as 1,500 slaves a year. And then the question is, were there other slave traders who were dealing in vastly larger quantities than the uh, than the Dutch. And it doesn't appear to be the case. It's also very clear from the records of the Dutch East India Company, and this is something, again, that uh, could have been brought up in this chapter, that slavery was not something that was exclusively, uh, that exclusively involved Africans. That you had uh, the Dutch, uh, you know, transported substantial numbers of slaves who were of Southeast Asian origin and substantial numbers of slaves who, were, who became slaves while living on the east coast of India. Figures have also been developed to show in the early 1600s. <clears throat> Again, this is uh, a century after the period of this chapter, but I think it was relevant to show that the primary uh, locus of uh, slave residence uh, was in coastal cities. That they were not uh, distributed in the countryside, but there are uh, cities that the Dutch dealt with, uh, like Batavia, their major uh, center in Indonesia. Uh, there's a fair number of coastal cities that have populations that are 40 to 50 percent slave populations. So what, what you appear to be seeing is a coastal culture uh, in which slaves are a, an important commodity, uh, play a very substantial role in the society, uh, but in the interior of, of India, uh, much, uh, much less so. Now, as for those slaves who come from Africa, prior to 1600, it appears that most of them don't go to the Middle East or India, but go to islands in the Indian Ocean. So that 
islands like the Maldives or Mauritius or Réunion, uh, later on uh, islands to develop a, um, uh, a colonial uh, uh, agricultural identity under, the, under French and other European auspices, uh, those islands gained a lot of their population through the movement of slaves from Africa. Now, from where in Africa? It appears that the largest number of slaves coming from Africa may have come from the island of Madagascar, uh, which means that they were uh, people originally, you know, with their lineages from Southeast Asia, rather than from mainland uh, Africa. Uh, there were uh, extensive wars on the island of Madagascar between um, uh, local rulers and the prisoners uh, were frequently uh, sold in, into slavery. Um, so the, the, whole, uh, the, the whole edifice of slavery, I think, is handled rather poorly in this chapter because the way it looks is that the Indian Ocean is sort of a, a mirror of the Atlantic uh, slave trade uh, with Africans being exported from East Africa for uh, to be slaves in India and the Middle East uh, and perhaps in some cases as far as China uh, just as the slaves from West Africa were going over to the New World. Um, but I think that in fact Indian Ocean slavery is a lot more, uh, a lot more complex, uh, both in terms of where the slaves came from and in terms of where they went to uh, and in terms of the degree to which they integrated with the society. It, is, it apparently is the case that the people who do the slave trading uh, are not Indians uh, if it, when you talk about seaborne trading. In all the way back to the time of the Vedas in the earliest phase of Indian culture, uh, there has been a... Um, a negative uh, you know, burden placed on anyone who crosses the black water, as seafaring was referred to. You, uh, for a Hindu to cross the black water uh, produced impurity that had to be uh, expiated in some fashion or other, and as a, to the degree that India was influenced by the, um, uh, by the uh, religious outlook of, uh, of Hinduism, or before uh, the emergence of Hinduism, of uh, Vedic culture, uh, seafaring was a frowned upon activity. It raises the question as to how, or rather who, um, was engaged in the movement of Indian uh, cultural influences away from South Asia. Uh, for example, um, in Indonesia, it's very clear that there was a strong Sanskrit and Indian influence uh, at a certain uh, early medieval period. But we don't know who was who the carriers were, and. The issue has arisen of were they people who, who traveled from elsewhere to India became um, integrated into Indian society in some fashion and then brought the Indian culture home uh, or were they Indians who went, uh, who went off expanding and looking for places to spread uh, their culture. Judging from the history of Buddhism in China and Korea, uh, it would appear 
that with the spread of Buddhism, the, the pilgrims who are most involved are uh, people from China and Korea who go to India and come back with uh, sacred texts rather than Indians who are, uh, who are leaving India. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a vexing question. It has to do with, uh, with the issue of, is it natural, well, let me put it differently. At the beginning of the course, I talked about common denominators among societies, that there are certain things that appear to be true of all societies at all times, true in the sense that they, uh, that they manifest one or another version of, uh, of some feeling, such as uh, religiosity or uh, art or something like that. And one of the questions is, is it, uh, is it characteristic of human groups that they want to expand their cultural uh, orbit? Are human groups categorically uh, outward looking or categorically inward looking, or is this a variable? And some human groups are, uh, let us say, conquerors or uh, wanderers, migrators, and other human groups um, stay at home. Uh, how would one tell? Um, it has been uh, often remarked that when you look you know, at modern data, which, where we actually have some fairly concrete data, that it appears that there are people who stay at home and people who leave. Uh, Scotsmen, for example, appear to find Scotland really boring and they go somewhere else, and Scot Scotsmen show up all over the world. Um, Egyptians, not so much. Egyptians notoriously like to stay at home. Um, I won't comment on whether that seems reasonable after visiting Cairo, but, uh, but it is a uh, commonly said of Egyptians. Um, and then when you look at people who do move, and you ask, why do they move where they move? And do they bring their culture, or do they adopt the culture of the place uh, where, they, where they end up? Um, why do Lebanese Shiites go to West Africa, uh, whereas Lebanese Christians uh, go to North America or South America? Um, you know, we, we don't have answers to, to things like that. But one of the questions, I think, in world history uh, has to do with uh, why, with whether we can, as historians, uh, come to any conclusions about why a particular culture uh, spreads or the means by which it spreads. Yeah. So let, me, let me share an example, which is recent. For the benefit of those of you who are watching the video, there's a question asked about, uh, about more recent um, phenomena of, of migration um, or cultural influence. Uh, you know, I, I think that, that a his, clearly for, as Americans and people who are necessarily involved in American history, the history of migration is a uh, is a really gripping part of American history and that nobody can ignore it. It has been recognized as a, a key element and when you study immigration in American history, it necessarily brings to mind the whole panoply of earlier and uh, other uh, instances of, uh, of migration. Uh, supposing you 
live in a country that has had no immigration. Um, and you've simply been yourselves for, as far as you can tell, kind of time immemorial. Um, does your uh, does your view of the world and of your culture uh, change substantially uh, as, a, you know, as a result of that? For example, if you are Danish and Denmark hasn't really been on the cutting edge of world conquest for a number of centuries now, um, but it has a very distinctive uh, national consciousness. Uh, will your um, attitude toward your culture uh, when it is uh, confronted, say, with Muslim immigrants be very different from the attitude, say, of the British uh, who were accustomed to being imperial overlords for, uh, for a couple of hundred years uh, and who might react to Muslim immigrants uh, differently. You know, we have lots of studies of this sort of thing in, nowadays about how people uh, integrate or fail to integrate, how cultures um, react or fail to react, whether multiculturalism is a practical reality or whether it is a utopian uh, myth. Uh, but when you deal historically, uh, you tend to deal with um, with artifacts uh, where you're looking at, say, an art uh, uh, practice that originates in one place and ends up someplace else. Uh, for example, in the period that this chapter deals with, uh, you have the rise of the Delhi Sultanate in northern India. Uh, there is now a very good book dealing with the uh, Muslim-Hindu interactions uh, in the area of art and architecture uh, during the period of the, uh, of the Delhi Sultanate uh, by um, a historian of art at NYU whose name is not coming to mind. Anyone know who he is? Anyway, we tried to hire him at Columbia and uh, it didn't work. But um, he looked at art in Afghanistan and art in northern India, and he found that an enormous fluidity, so that you had Indian characteristics showing up in Afghanistan, Persian characteristics showing up in northern India, evidence of artisans from different backgrounds uh, interacting in the creation of specific um, uh, monuments and so forth, and you, you look at it, at his evidence, and say you compare it with the, uh, with the period of the uh, rise of Islam, where you have the integration into some sort of a Muslim artistic synthesis of practices from the Persian uh, society or provincial Roman society, and you say, well, you know, it appears that um, you know, amalgamating here in, in, in two situations where you have Islamic conquests, that cultures amalgamate rather, uh, rather successfully on a kind of a street level basis that, you know, people have to build buildings, they have to uh, produce artistic goods or goods uh, that will sell in a market and you get a blending of, of practices. Um, this is not necessarily always the case. No, you can have rather rigid divides uh, between cultures instead of an amalgamation. And the question is whether an amalgamation of, of cultures is uh, whether there should be an emphasis placed on this. If I, when I look at this chapter on tropical Asia and Africa, 
my feeling is that this is that a, a better unifying theme than the one that was chosen, i.e. the works of Ibn Battuta, um, would be to talk about um, the extension of Islam into what I call the Muslim South. I'd say everything south of the latitude of Medina, which is 25 north latitude, uh, I define as the Muslim South. I'd say in this period, 1200 to 1500, this is the period of the great extension of Islam as a religion into sub-Saharan Africa, particularly the um, Sahel area, uh, into sub-Saharan East Africa, into the Indian Ocean, into India, although more in the, in the north than in the south, uh, and into uh, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, um, Indonesia, and the southern Philippines. I'd say, you know, there is, if we're talking about uh, an international pattern of, cultural and of culture and contact, that is the pattern. That is the, the thing that is spreading at this time, and the geographic locus of it is precisely the geographic locus that Ibn Battuta focuses on, namely the pilgrimage to Mecca. That would be, uh, that would be my take on this. I didn't write this chapter, as you may have guessed. Um, but that you opens uh, the author up to the critique of, is this overemphasizing Islam? Is this giving a particular importance to a intrusive religious tradition uh, at the expense of downgrading uh, the local traditions of West Africa, East Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia? Uh, is there a way to balance um, this, uh, this, sort of, uh, this sort of thing? Now, in earlier chapters, when we talked about the spread of religions, um, we had the, um, uh, in a sense, the benefit that uh, the ancient pagan religions, uh, polytheism of the ancient period, simply disappeared ultimately, and so we don't have to deal with uh, any Jove worshippers or, you know, Thor enthusiasts and so forth uh, these days. Uh, and but when you get to these uh, these sort of late medieval, early modern centuries, uh, you you really have this question of. Uh, of the, the grand picture of the spread of Islam in these areas and the, uh, the, the perfectly legitimate and understandable desire of each local society to, to maintain um, the historical memory of its own particular uh, characteristics. And how do you, uh, how do you, uh, how do you do justice to that? Um, certainly, if you say it is that Islam is the theme, um, you get engaged in the whole question for South Asia of Islam versus Hinduism, uh, which then translates into Pakistan versus India. You know, are you saying that Islam is more important than Hinduism because it is spreading, and Hinduism uh, is, let us say, contracting? Um, uh, that's a very difficult uh, position for a history book to, to find itself in because one of the objectives of a history book is to, uh, is to avoid political controversy, um, even perhaps while uh, consciously or unconsciously maintaining stereotypes that are ultimately political in, in character. But, uh, so that would be the theme that I would uh, pick for this chapter. Yeah. I was wondering, did, did Buddhism suffer more than Hinduism at the expense of Islam in India? Than now, the, the, the question is whether Buddhism suffered more than Hinduism at the expense of, of Islam. Um, 
there is a debate on, on whether or not Buddhism was dying in India before the Muslims came. Uh, as I understand it, most uh, South Asian historians feel that Buddhism was well on its way out or was diminishing uh, before Islam came, but that you still had in, uh, Buddhist institutions, uh, some of which were destroyed uh, in the process of Muslim, uh, Muslim conquest. Why Buddhism, uh, which after all originates in India, why Buddhism uh, fails in India and thrives in uh, Tibet, um, Mongolia, Southeast Asia, China, Japan, Korea. Um, that is a, that's a very vexing question. I have not read any, uh, any history that explains in a satisfactory way why that came about. And partly it's because there's a great deal of um, uh, a great deal of uh, ambiguity about what Hinduism was and when it comes into being. In other words, you have a uh, ancient religious texts, you know, which are the Vedas. Then you have a whole series of uh, religious uh, of genres of religious writing that are collectively known as Vedic literature. Uh, and you have uh, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas, and so forth, and all in Sanskrit, and this culminates in the Upanishads. And the Upanishads embody philosophical reflections on the entire Vedic tradition. And the Upanishads more or less form the foundation for, for Hinduism. Um, at a sort of a, at a the religious the level of religious intellection. Now, at, at a social level, there is a um, uh, a development of Buddhism and Jainism out of this tradition, and it go it, it's carried in other languages than Sanskrit, uh, and it gains a certain popularity. Uh, that popularity. Um, ultimately is challenged by a greater popularity by Hinduism. But whether it is something like what happens in China, where Neo-Confucianism um, you know, more or less uh, pushes Buddhism down to the popular level and keeps it from being the dominant religion after the rise of the Song, uh, or whether there is some, some other dynamic going on in India. It's just... Uh, it's just very hard to tell. Now, with Islam, uh, when you get to the way South Asian historians portray the, the coming of Islam, you get um, uh, rather extreme opinions on both sides. Uh, one of the most common opinions that you find expressed by, uh, by modern historians, South Asia, and I say opinions because I don't think that they're, they quite rise to the level of theories, um, is that uh, the Muslims came and threatened everyone with being killed unless they converted to Islam and therefore they converted people by the sword. Uh, Muslim historians um, deny that this ever happened uh, and yet the chronicles that exist will often refer to the number of prisoners taken in battle and so forth, but that is not the same thing as converting people by the sword. This is simply taking people prisoners after a battle and perhaps enslaving them. The, um, uh, the Emperor Akbar becomes a paragon for his tolerance of Hinduism and you know, a couple of reigns later uh, a later uh, ruler, Aurangzeb, becomes notorious for his Muslim fanaticism. It, it becomes a very complicated, uh, you know, competing set of stereotypes in which Buddhism simply drops out of the picture and doesn't get mentioned by much 
uh, by much of anyone. You have certain legends about how Buddhism comes to Tibet, but that's a, a, a different story. Um, this is all taking place after 1500 with Akbar and Aurangzeb. Um, and that is one of the awkward parts of this particular chapter, is the confinement uh, to a period of 1200 to 1500, which is not in particular a natural period. You know, why, why 1200? Well, it fits into, the, into part four uh, chronologically, but it doesn't have a, a particularly good rationale otherwise. Uh, when you, let me just say a bit more about this awkwardness. Uh, this week's chapter on tropical Asia and Africa will be followed by, ne next week, by a chapter on the Latin West, which is basically our version of the old Ren and Ref course, you know, Renaissance and Reformation. Um, kind of implying that those are still important, which could be debated. Uh, then that is followed by a chapter on maritime expansion, which is the old story of European exploration uh, democratized to talk about other people sailing around, uh, not just Europeans. Um, and they're all in the same time frame. So we're all dealing with something that ends, oh, say, 1550 or so. You know, should the world have been divided up differently? I mean, if you're going to say that uh, for the post-Mongol period, you know, 1200, you know, you're dealing with the beginning of the Mongols. Uh, we already dealt with the Mongols um, and the aftermath of the Mongols. Uh, now we're dividing up the rest of the, uh, the rest of the old world um, according to uh, being in the tropics or being in the Latin West or having to do with maritime uh, enterprise. Uh, this chapter, the, even though the time period includes the period of the Portuguese discovering the uh, the route to, uh, to the Indian Ocean around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and it includes the beginnings of European uh, intrusion into the Indian Ocean. They don't get mentioned in this chapter because that's sort of reserved for another chapter. Should that have been done? Uh, does it, uh, you know, what is the advantage of, of doing it that way? Uh, there, were, there are other possibilities. If you, um, you could concentrate exclusively on the question of, uh, of the Indian Ocean and leave out West Africa. Um, you could talk about West Africa, uh, the Western Mediterranean, and Portugal and Spain. They obviously fit very closely together because of uh, the history of European expansion. Uh, but we're sort of throwing the, uh, the West African Muslims into, uh, into this chapter. You could talk about Southeast Asia uh, and link it up with uh, Polynesia, uh, the Philippines, um, and uh, uh, going up into South China and um, maybe even as far as Korea and Japan. There are other ways uh, to do it. What, what happens when you're writing a world history textbook is that these sorts of questions get ironed out in author, uh, in author meetings and you, you decide, how are we going to divide up the world? And then um, you say, well, if we agree we're gonna divide up the world, let's say, and have a chapter on 
tropical Africa and Asia, who's going to write the chapter? So somebody raised his hand and said, I'm going to write the chapter. And now that person is given some latitude. OK, you're, you're it for that chapter. Um, how are you going to do it? Because we're going to fit the other chapters around it. And because you're working in a uh, collegial enterprise, uh, you bend in the direction of what a particular author wants to do. So for example, for next week with the Latin West, um, we had an author meeting in which we said, why are you only dealing with Western Europe? Why can't you throw in Eastern Europe? And he said, I don't want to throw in Eastern Europe. I want to deal with Western Europe. I think that that's enough. It's important. It's the Renaissance. It's Reformation. It's Hundred Years' War. It's, you know, Queen Elizabeth. I mean, hey, uh, how can you not have that as a separate topic? Um, regrettably, there, there is no, at least in, in the experience of our textbook writing, and I think with other textbooks as well, there's no overriding uh, compulsion to do it one way or another. And you end up uh, you know, compromising on, on a lot of issues. For example, there is a theory called Southernization. This is associated with a uh, world historian at Tufts named Linda Schaefer, who in fact was the person who began the project that culminated in the book The Earth and Its People, even though she dropped out of the project having, you know, after she began it. Uh, southernization is the idea that at a certain point the world sort of looks toward areas farther south. It's what I call um, uh, the history of the Muslim South, only she dates it uh, 300 years earlier. I associate it with the, uh, with the Mamluks, the Mongols, the end of the caliphate and the preeminence of the pilgrimage, she associates it with other sorts of things. So you can even, even when you have similar theories, they may not dovetail with respect to, uh, to chronology or causation or, um, or sources of evidence. Um, for this chapter, what, what we really had uh, ultimately was Ibn Battuta. And um, in my view, that is something that needs to be addressed in, uh, in the sixth edition of the book, which will be up for discussion come January. So that's all for today. <laughs>